Hi, this is Dion from Focus FocusChemistry.com. Uh, for today's discussion, we're going to talk about this very famous reaction in organic chemistry, the idoform test, or we call it in general the haloform test. Now, this particular reaction, um, some people call this the trihalo reaction or the trihalo test. If the halogen is an iodine, then it's called the triidomethane test. Now, this reaction, right, is covered in two different chapters in organic chemistry. We learned that this reaction is covered in a chapter of alcohols. If the alcohol has got a very special tr structure, it's got these three groups in blue, right? It will react with an oxidizing agent, which is uh, I2. I2 is a very, very big oxidizing agent. And it's an alkaline medium, right? Basically, when you warm it, so the, what happens is that this RCO group becomes a carboxylic group, okay? And the CH3 group comes up to become a triidomethane. And this is our yellow PPT, yellow precipitate. Okay. And other compounds that are formed will be iodide. The iodine basically gets reduced to iodide. And of course, the alcohol gets oxidized to a carboxylic acid. But because this medium is alkaline, it's basic, it becomes a salt of the acid. And the other byproduct that's formed in any redox reaction is always water. Now, some schools actually teach that this particular reaction, no matter what this R group is, as long as this reaction is possible, we find that the ratio between the coefficients, the, co the stoichiometric coefficients of iodine and hydroxide is 4 is to 6. Then you put a 5 behind here and a 5 behind here. This gives you the stoichiometric coefficients for this reaction. We also learned that in the next chapter after this is taught in schools, after the alcohol chapter, people normally teach the carbonyls chapter. Now the carbonyls chapter, right, Certain forms of carbonyls also undergo this idoform test. But you need to have this particular structure where there's a double bond O and another CH3 again. Now you notice from the first reaction where the CH3 goes to, the CH3 basically from the alcohol goes into the yellow solid. Same thing with this, the carbonyl. The carbonyl undergoes the tridomethane test, will react with the same reagents. And it's also warm. And surprisingly, the products are exactly the same. So the carbonyl becomes a carboxylate salt because it's alkaline. And then the CH3 group, the methyl group, will get removed from the organic compound to form a yellow piece precipitate again. And the other products will be also iodine and water for this because iodine is also reduced to iodide. Iodine is the oxidizing agent here. And water is the other byproduct. All right. But the funny thing is that the ratio for this stoichiometric ratio for the second reaction is different from the stoichiometric ratios from the alcohol reaction, and the stoichiometric ratios are 3, 4, 3, 3. Now, many students, when they learn these two reactions in these two chapters, they're taught in two different chapters, they always think of these two reactions as totally different reactions. But I'm gonna, what I'm going to show you now, right, is I'm going to show you that actually this entire reaction, these two reactions are actually linked together in the same mechanism. All right? And that is, the reaction actually starts from the alcohol, and the carbonyl is going to be the intermediate for this reaction. The carboxylate group is going to be the final product. So I'm going to show you the mechanism of this idoform test. And then we'll see that we're going to start with this alcohol as a first step. Then the carbonyl is going to be the intermediate. All right. So let's take a look at the mechanism. The reaction actually starts with an alcohol. The alcohol basically reacts with iodine and hydroxide. Now, if you study the group 7 chapter, we learned that iodine and hydroxide basically forms a very unstable intermediate called the iodate 1 ion. So basically, the iodine and hydroxide, alkaline iodine, forms this very unstable oxidizing agent, which is even stronger than iodine. And what happens is it's going to oxidize this alcohol to form a carbonyl. So what happens in this oxidation process is that these two H's, these hydrogen atoms, gets removed because oxidation is removal of hydrogens. And what happens is the two hydrogens, after getting removed, the alcohol now is left with a methyl ketone, methyl carbonyl, which is actually the reaction in the carbonyl, rea in the carbonyl chapter. So what you notice is that the first step of this reaction is that the alcohol, which is, has got CH3 group, undergoes oxidation by OI minus, and it forms a methyl carbonyl. All right? You want to balance this equation, you just need to put Basically, in a balanced equation, we normally put the oxidizing agents on the arrow. 
and we balance it by putting the two H's on the right from one water. You put one oxygen here, this is how you balance the first equation. So the product of the first step is actually the methyl carbonyl. The methyl carbonyl, which actually is the reaction that we learned in the carbonyl chapter. Now, after the first step of this mechanism, where the alpha, this um, methyl alcohol gets oxidized to become a methyl carbonyl, what happens in the next step, right, is an interesting, it's about an interesting property of this methyl carbonyl. Now, the methyl carbonyl basically, if you look at the structure, okay, it contains this CH3 group, okay, and where this carbon is called the alpha carbon. This is called the alpha carbon. Now, how do you name alpha carbons in carbonyls? Basically, in carbonyls, the CO group, the CO group as a reference, the first carbon on the left and on the right of this carbonyl group is called the alpha carbon. So over here, you notice there's one alpha carbon here. And of course, if the R group contains other carbon atoms, then of course, there's an alpha carbon here. So the key thing is that this methyl carbonyl has got at least one alpha, car one alpha carbon with three hydrogens attached to this alpha carbon. Now this hydrogen here that's attached to the alpha carbon of a carbonyl has got a very interesting property. And that is, this hydrogen is actually slightly acidic. Now why is it acidic? Because after this hydrogen is lost as an acid in a reversible reaction, you find that the negative charge is on this carbon with the two remaining H's and the proton is lost. Now this particular anion, called the enolate ion, this particular ion, right, uh, there's a carbon with a high electron density because of the extra electron here and a CO group which has got high electron density because of the double bond here. These two regions of high electron density separated by a single bond always results in this electron traveling from this carbon to this carbon to this oxygen and shifting back and forth. This spare electron here is able to travel within between these three carbons, these three are atoms. And this phenomenon where the electron is delocalized, what we call this, this is called a resonance effect. Resonance effect basically in organic chemistry means the delocalization of electrons. And this delocalization always creates stability. So that tells you that the conjugate base of this particular carbonyl is stable. And therefore, this hydrogen can be lost as an acidic hydrogen. But bear in mind, even though this is acidic, it's only slightly acidic. Which means if you compare the acidity of this methyl carbonyls, it actually is more acidic than a usual hydrocarbons hydrogen. But it's nowhere as acidic as an alcohol or a phenol or a carboxylic acid. These three compounds, their acidity is much stronger, much higher than the alpha carbon's acidity over here. But nevertheless, right, this is slightly acidic and therefore uh, this hydrogen can be removed as a proton. And that's what's going to happen in the next step. In the next step, there's going to be a reaction between that alpha hydrogen and the hydroxide, which is a solvent for this reaction. You know, this either form test has got hydroxide in there. So in the next step, what happens is that the hydroxide ion, the electrons here is donated to the hydrogen here, and the lone pair, the bonding electrons here will be donated to the iodine molecule. The iodine molecule, right, this iodine will capture the electrons from this bond and therefore give up this lone pair, this bonded pair to this iodine. This bond is going to break and the H is going to leave over here as a H, HI, okay? And basically the I will come in here. So the intermediate is going to look like this. This hydrogen will come out to form water. Proton is lost. Then the iodine will come in to form a bond with this carbon. I'm going to show the iodine in the form of, sorry. I'm going to draw a bond here, and that's where iodine is going to be. So I repeat this again. Huh? What's happening is that the hydroxide gives a lone pair to hydrogen, then this bond will cleave in this manner. The two electrons here on this bonding, on this covalent bond, is going to give to iodine as a dative bond. So iodine will come in to form a bond with carbon, and then these two electrons will be given to this iodine. So besides water being a byproduct, the other byproduct is iodide. Two electrons here come to here to form an iodide. This bond will be cleaved. This I without this electron will come here to form a bond with this carbon through this bonding pair of electrons. So this is the first intermediate. So what happens after this, right, is that this process repeats itself two more times so that these two other hydrogens, which is alpha hydrogens, will be replaced subsequently. So this thing repeats two more times over here. 
where this hydroxide iodine comes in to remove all these two hydrogens and the product is a Ci3. So what you notice, right, is that the three H's has been replaced totally by three iodines. Okay, and in the last step, what happens in the last step? What happens in the last step is that the hydroxide ion plays a very important role in the last step. Hydroxide ion starts to behave as a nucleophile, and this is a carbonyl. And carbonyls, you know, undergoes nucleophilic reaction. So this carbonyl's carbon has got a delta positive. The oxygen has got a delta negative. So what happens is that this lone pair is donated to this carbon in a usual nucleophilic addition reaction and this carbon would have 5 bonds so it gives out one bonding pair of electrons in a pi bond to this oxygen. So it creates an intermediate that looks very familiar to us which is in this manner Ci3, OH and the R group. Right? It's an addition reaction. Then what happens is that, is that this uh, hydroxide the hydroxide is going to remove this, right? The hydroxide, actually it's the water, sorry, it's the water, not the hydroxide. The water molecule itself is polar, right? The two electrons here will be given to oxygen. This thing will be cleaved in this manner. Hydroxide will be reformed again. The H plus basically will be coming over here. What happens is that this, this pair of electrons breaks. Okay, this thing breaks. This, uh, this pair of electrons come back here to form a double bond. Double bond is formed here. This bond is cleaved. And then basically what happens is it forms Ci3 minus. Ci3 minus with a H forms CHI3, which is a yellow PPT. So it's a H plus that comes over here to form a bond with Ci3 minus to form HCHI3. This one of its pair of electrons of oxygen will come back to form a double bond. the carboxylic acid is formed. Now the carboxylic acid will not be the final product because this particular reaction happens in an alkaline medium. So the base in the very final step basically will strip off the H from here. So this acid here will finally become a carboxylic ion because the medium is basic. And there you have it. You've got one of the products here, the carboxylic ion, right? And the CHI3 which is essentially this compound here. And this is basically how this, this reaction happens. So what I'm trying to say is that you are learning this particular same reaction in two different chapters, okay? Actually, you look at the mechanism, right? The mechanism actually starts with the alcohol, in the alcohol chapter, where the carbonyl is the intermediate, and therefore you learn the same reaction in the carbonyl chapter as well. So if you can start the reaction from the alcohol, you can also start a reaction with the carbonyl. And the end product will still be the same as the carboxylic ion, right? One last thing is this. You will notice, right, there are three H's here, and therefore this particular step, we call this step two, this is step one, this is step three. This particular step, right, repeats itself three times because the three H's will be removed to substitute with three iodines. If your carbonyl doesn't contain three H's but contains one H with two iodines, that means if your carbonyl that you start off with is not three H's but it's something like that, will this reaction still take place? The answer is yes. It's just that this removal of the alpha hydrogen is just in one step. It comes into this step immediately. So any compound which has got not only just a CH3, CH if it's also a CHI2 or CH2I, as long as there's only one H, at least one hydrogen atom, alpha hydrogen atom, you will undergo positive idoform test. All right? It doesn't need to have all the three H's. It can be substituted with two I's or one I, and this idoform test can still happen, and you basically still see the yellow precipitate. All right? That's all I have for you today about the halophone test. Thank you for watching. This is Dion again, signing off from focuschemistry.com. Thank you.